Good evening. Hello. How are you this evening? I'm just thinking of one person today that I'm incredibly grateful for. Can you think of anyone? We are starting, this is very exciting, we're starting The Merchant of Venice today. Act 1, Scene 1. Venice, a street. Enter Antonio, so that was a merchant of Venice. Salarino and Solano, who are both his friends. Antonio. In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. It wearies me. You say it wearies you. But how I caught it, found it, or came by it, what stuff tis made of, whereof it is born, I am to learn. And such a want wit sadness makes of me that I have much ado to know myself. Salarino. Your mind is tossing on the ocean. There, where your argosies with portly sail, like signors and rich burghers of the flood, or, as it were, the pageants of the sea, do overpeer the petty traffickers that curtsy to them, do them reverence, as they fly by them with their woven wings. Solanio, believe me, sir, had I such venture forth, the better part of my affections would be with my hopes abroad. I should be still plucking the grass to know where sits the wind, peering in maps for ports and piers and roads, and every object that might make me fear misfortune to my ventures, out of doubt, would make me sad. Salarino, my wind cooling my broth would blow me to an ague when I thought what harm a wind too great might do at sea. I should not see the sandy hourglass run, but I should think of shallows and of flats, and see my wealthy Andrew docked in sand, veiling her high top lower than her ribs, to kiss her burial. Should I go to church and see the holy edifice of stone, and not bethink me straight of dangerous rocks, which touching my gentle vessel's side would scatter all her spices on the stream. Enrobe the roaring waters with my silks. And in a word, but even now worth this and now worth nothing. Shall I have the thought to think on this? And shall I lack the thought that such a thing bechanced would make me sad? But tell not me, I know Antonio is sad to think upon his merchandise. Antonio, believe me, no. I thank my fortune for it. My ventures are not in one bottom trusted, not to one place, nor is my whole estate upon the fortune of this present year. Therefore, my merchandise makes me not sad. Salarino, why, then you are in love. For Antonio, fie, fie. Salarino, not in love neither. Then, let's say you're sad because you are not merry. And twas easy for you to laugh and leap and say you are merry because you are not sad. Now by two-headed Yarnus, nature hath framed strange fellows in her time, some that will evermore peep through their eyes and laugh like parrots and bagpiper, and other of such vinegar aspect that they'll not show their teeth in way of a smile, though Nestor swear the jest be laughable. Solanio. Oh, here comes Bassanio, your most noble kinsman, Gratiano and Lorenzo. Fare ye well, we leave you now with better company. Salarino, I would have stayed till I had made you merry, if worthier friends had not prevented me. Antonio. Your worth is very dear in my regard. I take it your own business calls on you and you embrace the occasion to depart. Enter Bassanio, Lorenzo and Gratiano. Salarino, good morrow, my good lords. Bassanio, good signors both, when shall we laugh? Say when. You grow exceedingly strange. Must it be so? Salarino, we'll make our leisures to attend on yours. Exunt, Salarino and Solanio. Lorenzo, my Lord Bassanio, since you have found Antonio, we too will leave you. But at dinner time, I pray you, 
Have in mind where we must meet. Bassanio, I will not fail you. Gratiano. Yes, Gratiano. You look not well, Signor Antonio. You have too much respect upon the world. They lose it that do buy it with much care. Believe me, you are marvellously changed. Antonio, I hold the world but as the world, Gratiano, a stage where every man must play a part and mine a sad one. Gratiano, let me play the fool. With mirth and laughter let old wrinkles come and let my liver rather heat with wine than my heart cool with mortifying groans. Why should a man whose blood is warm within sit like his grandsire cut in alabaster, sleep when he wakes and creep into the jaundice by being peevish? I tell thee what, Antonio, I love thee and it is my love that speaks. There are a sort of men whose visages do cream and mantle like a standing pond and do a willful stillness entertain with purpose to be dressed in an opinion of wisdom, gravity, profound conceit, as who should say, I am Sir Oracle, and when I open my lips, let no dog bark. O oh, my Antonio, I do know of these, that therefore only are reputed wise for saying nothing, when I am very sure if they should speak, would almost damn those ears, which hearing them would call their brothers fools. I'll tell thee more of this another time, but fish not with this melancholy bait. For this fool gudgeon, this opinion. Come, good Lorenzo, fare ye well a while. I'll end my exhortation after dinner. Lorenzo, well, we will leave you then till dinner time. I must be one of those same dumb wise men, for Gratiano never lets me speak. Gratiano. Well, keep me company for two years mo, thou shalt not know the sound of thine own tongue. Antonio, fare ye well, I'll grow a talker for this gear. Gratiano, thanks, if faith, for silence is only commendable in a neat's tongue dried, and a maid not vendable. Exunt, Gratiano and Lorenzo. Antonio, is that anything now? Bassanio, Gratiano speaks an infinite deal of nothing, more than any man in all Venice. His reasons are as two grains of wheat hid in two bushels of chaff. You shall seek all day, you find them, and when you have them, they are not worth the search. Antonio, well, tell me now, what lady is the same to whom you swore a secret pilgrimage that you today promised to tell me of? Bassanio. Tis not unknown to you, Antonio, how much I have disabled mine own estate by something showing a more swelling port than my faint means would grant continuance. Nor do I now make moan to be abridged from such a noble rate, but my chief care is to come fairly off from the great debts. Where in my time something too prodigal hath left me gauged. To you, Antonio, I owe the most in money and in love. And from your love, I have a warranty to unburden all my plots and purposes, how to get clear of all the debts I owe. Antonio, I pray you, good Bassanio, let me know it. And if it stand, as you yourself still do, within the eye of honour, be assured my purse, my person, my extremist means lie all unlocked to your occasions. Bassanio, in my school days, when I had lost one shaft, I shot his fellow of the self-same flight, the self-same way with more advised watch, to find the other fourth. And by adventuring both, I oft found both. I urge this childhood proof because what follows is pure innocence. I owe you much. And like a willful youth, that which I owe is lost. But if you please to shoot another arrow, that self way which you did shoot the first, I do not doubt, as I will watch the aim, or to find both, 
or bring your latter hazard back again and thankfully rest debtor for the first. Antonio, you know me well and herein spend but time to wind about my love with circumstance. And out of doubt, you do me now more wrong in making question of my uttermost than if you had made waste of all I have. Then do but say to me what I should do, that in your knowledge may by me be done, and I am pressed unto it. Therefore speak, Bassanio. In Belmont is a lady richly left, and she is fair, and fairer than that word of wondrous virtues. Sometimes from her eyes I did receive fair speechless messages. Her name is Portia. Nothing undervalued to Cato's daughter, Brutus's Portia. Nor is the wide world ignorant of her worth, for the four winds blow in from every coast renowned suitors and her sunny locks hang on her temples like a golden fleece, which makes her seat of Belmont Colchos strand, and many Jasons come in quest of her. Oh, my Antonio, had I but the means to hold a rival place with one of them, I have a mind presages me such thrift that I should questionless be fortunate. Antonio. Thou knowest that all my fortunes are at sea. Neither have I money nor commodity to raise a present sum. Therefore go forth, try what my credit can in Venice do. That shall be racked even to the uttermost to furnish thee to Belmont, to fair Portia. Go, presently inquire, and so will I, where money is. And I no question make to have it of my trust or for my sake. Excellent. And that is the end of Act 1, Scene 1 of The Merchant of Venice. A nice little opener, in my opinion. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, I would love you to give a little like to the video and to subscribe to my channel. That would be amazing. If you found any of it hard to understand or need any help or any comments that you want to throw my way, feel free to email me or to write a comment on the video and I will most surely address it. See you next week for Act 2, Act 1, Scene 2 of A Merchant of Venice.